Chapter One of Indian Child Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Indian Child Life by Charles Eastman. The Pitiful Last what boy would not be an indian for a while when he thinks of the freest life in the world this life was mine every day there was a real hunt there was real game no people have a better use of their five senses than the children of the wilderness we could smell as well as hear and see we could feel and taste as well as we could see and hear nowhere has the memory been more fully developed than in the wild life and i can still see wherein i owe much to my early training of course i myself do not remember when i first saw the day but my brothers have often recalled the event with much mirth for it was a custom of the sioux that when a boy was born his brother must plunge into the water or roll in the snow naked if it was winter time and if he was not big enough to do either of these himself water was thrown on him if the newborn had a sister she must be immersed the idea was that a warrior had come to camp and the other children must display some act of hardihood i was so unfortunate as to be the youngest of five children who soon after i was born were left motherless i had to bear the humiliating name hakeda meaning the pitiful last until i should earn a more dignified and appropriate name i was regarded as little more than a plaything by the rest of the children the babe was done up as usual in a movable cradle made from an oak board two and a half feet long and one and a half feet wide on one side of it was nailed with brass-headed tacks the richly embroidered sack which was open in front and laced up and down with buckskin strings over the arms of the infant was a wooden bow the ends of which were firmly attached to the board so that if the cradle should fall the child's head and face would be protected on this bow were hung curious playthings strings of artistically carved bones and hoofs of deer which rattled when the little hands moved them in this upright cradle i lived played and slept the greater part of the time during the first few months of my life whether i was made to lean against a lodgepole or was suspended from a bough of a tree while my grandmother cut wood or whether i was carried on her back or conveniently balanced by another child in a similar cradle hung on the opposite side of a pony i was still in my oaken bed this grandmother who had already lived through sixty years of hardships was a wonder to the young maidens of the tribe she showed no less enthusiasm over hakeda than she had done when she held her firstborn the boy's father in her arms every little attention that is due to a loved child she performed with much skill and devotion she made all my scanty garments and my tiny moccasins with a great deal of taste it was said by all that i could not have had more attention had my mother been living Anchida, grandmother was a great singer sometimes when hakeda wakened too early in the morning she would sing to him something like the following lullaby sleep sleep my boy the chippewas are far away are far away sleep sleep my boy prepare to meet the foe by day the foe by day the cowards will not dare to fight till morning break till morning break sleep sleep my child while still tis night then bravely wake then bravely wake the dakota women were wont to cut and bring their fuel from the woods 
and in fact to perform most of the drudgery of the camp this of necessity fell to their lot because the men must follow the game during the day very often my grandmother carried me with her on these excursions and while she worked it was her habit to suspend me from a wild grapevine or a springy bough so that the least breeze would swing the cradle to and fro she has told me that when i had grown old enough to take notice i was apparently capable of holding extended conversations in an unknown dialect with birds and red squirrels once i fell asleep in my cradle suspended five or six feet from the ground while uncheedah was some distance away gathering birch bark for a canoe a squirrel had found it convenient to come upon the bow of my cradle and nibble his hickory nut until he awoke me by dropping the crumbs of his meal it was a common thing for birds to alight on my cradle in the woods after i left my cradle i almost walked away from it she told me she then began calling my attention to natural objects whenever i heard the song of a bird she would tell me what bird it came from something after this fashion hakeda listen to shechoka the robin calling his mate he says he has just found something good to eat or listen to upa hanska the thrush he is singing for his little wife he will sing his best when in the evening the whippoorwill started his song with vim no further than a stone's throw from our tent in the woods she would say to me hush it may be an ojibway scout again when i waked at midnight she would say do not cry hinakaga the owl is watching you from the treetop i usually covered up my head for i had perfect faith in my grandmother's admonitions and she had given me a dreadful idea of this bird it was one of her legends that a little boy was once standing just outside of the teepee tent crying vigorously for his mother when hinakaga swooped down in the darkness and carried the poor little fellow up into the trees it was well known that the hoot of the owl was commonly imitated by indian scouts when on the warpath there had been dreadful massacres immediately following this call therefore it was deemed wise to impress the sound early upon the mind of the child indian children were trained so that they hardly ever cried much in the night this was very expedient and necessary in their exposed life in my infancy it was my grandmother's custom to put me to sleep as she said with the birds and to waken me with them until it became a habit she did this with an object in view an indian must always rise early in the first place as a hunter he finds his game best at daybreak secondly other tribes when on the warpath usually make their attack very early in the morning even when our people are moving about leisurely we like to rise before daybreak in order to travel when the air is cool and unobserved perchance by our enemies as a little child it was instilled into me to be silent and reticent this was one of the most important traits to form in the character of the indian as a hunter and warrior it was considered absolutely necessary to him and was thought to lay the foundations of patience and self-control end of the pitiful last recording by lucretia b chapter two of indian child life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Indian Child Life by Charles Eastman Early Hardships One of the earliest recollections of my adventurous childhood is the ride I had on a pony's side. I was passive in the whole matter. A little girl cousin of mine was put in a bag and suspended from the horn of an Indian saddle. But her weight must be balanced or the saddle would not remain on the animal's back. Accordingly, I was put into another sack and made to keep the saddle and the girl in position. I did not object, for I had a very pleasant game of peekaboo with the little girl until we came to a big snowdrift where the poor beast was stuck fast and began to lie down then it was not so nice this was the convenient and primitive way in which some mothers packed their children for winter journeys however cold the weather might be the inmate of the fur-lined sack was usually very comfortable at least i used to think so i believe i was accustomed to all the precarious indian conveyances and as a boy i enjoyed the dog travaux ride as much as any the travaux consisted of a set of rawhide strips securely lashed to the tent poles which were harnessed to the sides of the animal as if he stood between shafts while the free ends were allowed to drag on the ground both ponies and large dogs were used as beasts of burden and they carried in this way the smaller children as well as the baggage this mode of traveling for children was possible only in the summer and as the dogs were sometimes unreliable the little ones were exposed to a certain amount of danger for instance whenever a train of dogs had been traveling for a long time almost perishing with the heat and their heavy loads a glimpse of water would cause them to forget all their responsibilities some of them in spite of the screams of the women would swim with their burdens into the cooling stream and i was thus on more than one occasion made to partake of an unwilling bath i was a little over four years old at the time of the sioux massacre in minnesota in the general turmoil we took flight into british columbia and the journey is still vividly remembered by all our family a yoke of oxen and a lumber wagon were taken from some white farmer and brought home for our conveyance how delighted i was when i learned that we were to ride behind those wise-looking animals and in that gorgeously painted wagon it seemed almost like a living creature to me this new vehicle with four legs and the more so when we got out of axle grease and the wheels went along squealing like pigs the boys found a great deal of innocent fun in jumping from the high wagon while the oxen were leisurely moving along my elder brothers soon became experts at last i mustered up courage enough to join them in this sport i was sure they stepped on the wheel so i cautiously placed my moccasined foot upon it alas before i could realize what had happened i was under the wheels and had it not been for the neighbor immediately behind us i might have been run over by the next team as well this was my first experience with a civilized vehicle i cried out all possible reproaches on the white man's team and concluded that a dog travaux was good enough for me i was really rejoiced that we were moving away from the people who made the wagon that had almost ended my life and it did not occur to me that i alone was to blame i could not be persuaded to ride in that wagon again and was glad when we finally left it beside the missouri river the summer after the minnesota massacre general sibley pursued our people across this river now the missouri is considered one of the most treacherous rivers in the world even a good modern boat is not safe upon its uncertain current we were forced to cross in buffalo skin boats as round as tubs the washachu white men were coming in great numbers with their big guns and while most of our men were fighting them to gain time 
the women and the old men made and equipped the temporary boats braced with ribs of willow some of these were towed by two or three women or men swimming in the water and some by ponies it was not an easy matter to keep them right side up with their helpless freight of little children and such goods as we possessed in our flight we little folks were strapped in the saddles or held in front of an older person and in the long night marches to get away from the soldiers we suffered from loss of sleep and insufficient food our meals were eaten hastily and sometimes in the saddle water was not always to be found the people carried it with them in bags formed of tripe or the dried pericardium of animals now we were compelled to trespass upon the country of hostile tribes and were harassed by them almost daily and nightly only the strictest vigilance saved us one day we met with another enemy near the british lines it was a prairie fire we were surrounded another fire was quickly made which saved our lives one of the most thrilling experiences of the following winter was a blizzard which overtook us in our wanderings here and there a family lay down in the snow selecting a place where it was not likely to drift much for a day and a night we lay under the snow uncle stuck a long pole beside us to tell us when the storm was over we had plenty of buffalo robes and the snow kept us warm but we found it heavy after a time it became packed and hollowed out around our bodies so that we were as comfortable as one can be under those circumstances the next day the storm ceased and we discovered a large herd of buffaloes almost upon us we dug our way out shot some of the buffaloes made a fire and enjoyed a good dinner i was now in exile as well as motherless yet i was not unhappy our wanderings from place to place afforded us many pleasant experiences and quite as many hardships and misfortunes there were times of plenty and times of scarcity and we had several narrow escapes from death in savage life the early spring is the most trying time and almost all the famines occurred at this period of the year the indians are a patient and a clannish people their love for one another is stronger than that of any civilized people i know if this were not so i believe there would have been tribes of cannibals among them white people have been known to kill and eat their companions in preference to starving but indians never in times of famine the adults often denied themselves in order to make the food last as long as possible for the children who were not able to bear hunger as well as the old as a people they can live without food much longer than any other nation i once passed through one of these hard springs when we had nothing to eat for several days i well remember the six small birds which constituted the breakfast for six families one morning and then we had no dinner or supper to follow what a relief that was to me although i had only a small wing of a small bird for my share soon after this we came into a region where buffaloes were plenty and hunger and scarcity were forgotten such was the indian's wild life when game was to be had and the sun shone they easily forgot the bitter experiences of the winter before little preparation was made for the future they are children of nature and occasionally she whips them with the lashes of experience yet they are forgetful and careless much of their suffering might have been prevented by a little calculation during the summer when nature is at her best and provides abundantly for the savage it seems to me that no life is happier than his food is free lodging free everything free all were alike rich in the summer and again all were alike poor in the winter and early spring however 
their diseases were fewer and not so destructive as now and the indian's health was generally good the indian boy enjoyed such a life as almost all boys dream of and would choose for themselves if they were permitted to do so the raids made upon our people by other tribes were frequent and we had to be constantly on the watch i remember at one time a night attack was made upon our camp and all our ponies stampeded only a few of them were recovered and our journeys after this misfortune were effected mostly by means of the dog travaux the second winter after the massacre my father and my two older brothers with several others were betrayed by a half-breed at winnipeg to the united states authorities as i was then living with my uncle in another part of the country i became separated from them for ten years during all this time we believed that they had been killed by the whites and i was taught that i must avenge their deaths as soon as i was able to go upon the war-path end of early hardships recording by lucretia b of indian child life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Indian Child Life by Charles Eastman An Indian Sugar Camp With the first March thaw, the thoughts of the Indian women of my childhood days turned promptly to the annual sugar-making. This industry was chiefly followed by the old men and women and the children. The rest of the tribe went out upon the spring fur hunt at this season, leaving us at home to make the sugar the first and most important of the necessary utensils were the huge iron and brass kettles for boiling everything else could be made but these must be bought begged or borrowed a maple tree was felled and a log canoe hollowed out into which the sap was to be gathered little troughs of basswood and birchen basins were also made to receive the sweet drops as they trickled from the tree as soon as these labors were accomplished we all proceeded to the bark sugar house which stood in the midst of a fine grove of maples on the bank of the minnesota river we found this hut partially filled with the snows of winter and the withered leaves of the preceding autumn and it must be cleared for our use in the meantime a tent was pitched outside for a few days occupancy the snow was still deep in the woods with a solid crust upon which we could easily walk for we usually moved to the sugar house before the sap had actually started the better to complete our preparations my grandmother did not confine herself to canoe making she also collected a good supply of fuel for the fires for she would not have much time to gather wood when the sap began to flow presently the weather moderated and the snow began to melt the month of april brought showers which carried most of it off into the minnesota river now the women began to test the trees moving leisurely among them axe in hand and striking a single quick blow to see if the sap would appear trees like people have their individual characters some were ready to yield up their life-blood while others were more reluctant now one of the birchen basins was set under each tree and a hardwood chip driven deep into the cut which the axe had made from the corners of this chip at first drop by drop then more freely the sap trickled into the little dishes it is usual to make sugar from maples but several other trees were also tapped by the indians from the birch and ash was made a dark-colored sugar with a somewhat bitter taste which was used for medicinal purposes the box elder yielded a beautiful white sugar whose only fault was that there was never enough of it 
a long fire was now made in the sugar house and a row of brass kettles suspended over the blaze the sap was collected by the women in tin or birchen buckets and poured into the canoes from which the kettles were kept filled the hearts of the boys beat high with pleasant anticipations when they heard the welcome hissing sound of the boiling sap each boy claimed one kettle for his especial charge it was his duty to see that the fire was kept under it to watch lest it boil over and finally when the sap became syrup to test it upon the snow dipping it out with a wooden paddle so frequent were these tests that for the first day or two we consumed nearly all that could be made and it was not until the sweetness began to pall that my grandmother set herself in earnest to store up sugar for future use she made it into cakes of various forms in birchen moulds and sometimes in hollow canes or reeds and the bills of ducks and geese some of it was pulverized and packed in rawhide cases being a prudent woman she did not give it to us after the first month or so except upon special occasions and it was thus made to last almost the year around the smaller candies were reserved as an occasional treat for the little fellows and the sugar was eaten at feasts with wild rice or parched corn and also with pounded dried meat coffee and tea with their substitutes were all unknown to us in those days every pursuit has its trials and anxieties my grandmother's special tribulations during the sugaring season were the upsetting and gnawing of holes in her birch bark pans the transgressors were the rabbit and squirrel tribes and we little boys for once became useful in shooting them with our bows and arrows we hunted all over the sugar camp until the little creatures were fairly driven out of the neighborhood occasionally one of my older brothers brought home a rabbit or two and then we had a feast i remember on this occasion of our last sugar bush in minnesota that i stood one day outside of our hut and watched the approach of a visitor a bent old man his hair almost white and carrying on his back a large bundle of red willow or kanikanik which the indians use for smoking he threw down his load at the door and thus saluted us you have indeed perfect weather for sugar-making it was my great-grandfather cloud man whose original village was on the shores of lakes calhoun and harriet now in the suburbs of the city of minneapolis he was the first sioux chief to welcome the protestant missionaries among his people and a well-known character in those pioneer days he brought us word that some of the peaceful sugar makers near us on the river had been attacked and murdered by roving ojibways this news disturbed us not a little for we realized that we too might become the victims of an ojibwe war party therefore we all felt some uneasiness from this time until we returned heavy laden to our village End of an indian sugar camp recording by lucretia b or of indian child life this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Indian Child Life by Charles Eastman Games and Sports The Indian boy was a prince of the wilderness. He had but very little work to do during the period of his boyhood his principal occupation was the practice of a few simple arts in warfare and the chase aside from this he was master of his time it is true that our savage life was a precarious one and full of dreadful catastrophes however this never prevented us from enjoying our sports to the fullest extent as we left our teepees in the morning we were never sure that our scalps would not dangle from a pole in the afternoon 
it was an uncertain life to be sure yet we observed that the fawns skipped and played happily while the gray wolves might be peeping forth from behind the hills ready to tear them limb from limb our sports were molded by the life and customs of our people indeed we practiced only what we expected to do when grown our games were feats with the bow and arrow foot and pony races wrestling swimming and imitation of the customs and habits of our fathers we had sham fights with mud balls and willow wands we played lacrosse made war upon bees shot winter arrows which were used only in that season and coasted upon the ribs of animals and buffalo robes no sooner did the boys get together than as a usual thing they divided into squads and chose sides then a leading arrow was shot at random into the air before it fell to the ground a volley from the bows of the participants followed each player was quick to note the direction and speed of the leading arrow and he tried to send his own at the same speed and at an equal height so that when it fell it would be closer to the first than any of the others it was considered out of place to shoot by first sighting the object aimed at this was usually impracticable in actual life because the object was almost always in motion while the hunter himself was often upon the back of a pony at full gallop therefore it was the off-hand shot that the indian boy sought to master there was another game with arrows that was characterized by gambling and was generally confined to the men the races were an everyday occurrence at noon the boys were usually gathered by some pleasant sheet of water and as soon as the ponies were watered they were allowed to graze for an hour or two while the boys stripped for their noonday sports a boy might say to some other whom he considered his equal i can't run but i will challenge you to fifty paces a former hero when beaten would often explain his defeat by saying i drank too much water boys of all ages were paired for a spin and the little red men cheered on their favorites with spirit as soon as this was ended the pony races followed all the speedy ponies were picked out and riders chosen if a boy declined to ride there would be shouts of derision last of all came the swimming a little urchin would hang to his pony's long tail while the latter with only his head above water glided sportively along finally the animals were driven into a fine field of grass and we turned our attention to other games the mud and willow fight was rather a severe and dangerous sport a lump of soft clay was stuck on the end of a limber and springy willow wand and thrown as boys throw apples from sticks with considerable force when there were fifty or a hundred players on each side the battle became warm but anything to arouse the bravery of indian boys seemed to them a good and wholesome diversion wrestling was largely indulged in by us all it may seem odd but wrestling was done by a great many boys at once from ten to any number on a side it was really a battle in which each one chose his opponent the rule was that if a boy sat down he was let alone but as long as he remained standing within the field he was open to an attack no one struck with the hand but all manner of tripping with legs and feet and butting with the knees was allowed altogether it was an exhausting pastime fully equal to the american game of football and only the young athlete could really enjoy it one of our most curious sports was a war upon the nests of wild bees we imagined ourselves about to make an attack upon the ojibways or some tribal foe we all painted and stole cautiously upon the nest then with a rush and war-hoop sprang upon the object of our attack and endeavored to destroy it but it seemed that the bees were always on the alert and never entirely surprised 
for they always raised quite as many scalps as did their bold assailants after the onslaught upon the nest was ended we usually followed it by a pretended scalp dance on the occasion of my first experience in this mode of warfare there were two other little boys who were also novices one of them particularly was really too young to indulge in an exploit of that kind as it was the custom of our people when they killed or wounded an enemy on the battlefield to announce the act in a loud voice we did the same my friend little wound as i will call him for i do not remember his name being quite small was unable to reach the nest until it had been well trampled upon and broken and the insects had made a counter charge with such vigor as to repulse and scatter our numbers in every direction however he evidently did not want to retreat without any honors so he bravely jumped upon the nest and yelled i the brave little wound to-day kill the only fierce enemy scarcely were the last words uttered when he screamed as if stabbed to the heart one of his older companions shouted dive into the water run dive into the water for there was a lake near by this advice he obeyed when we had reassembled and were indulging in our mimic dance little wound was not allowed to dance he was considered not to be in existence he had been killed by our enemies the bee tribe poor little fellow his swollen face was sad and ashamed as he sat on a fallen log and watched the dance although he might well have styled himself one of the noble dead who had died for their country yet he was not unmindful that he had screamed and this weakness would be apt to recur to him many times in the future we had some quiet plays which we alternated with the more severe and warlike ones among them were throwing wands and snow arrows in the winter we coasted much we had no double rippers or toboggans but six or seven of the long ribs of a buffalo fastened together at the larger end answered all practical purposes sometimes a strip of basswood bark four feet long and about six inches wide was used with considerable skill we stood on one end and held the other using the slippery inside of the bark for the outside and thus coasting down long hills with remarkable speed the spinning of tops was one of the all-absorbing winter sports we made our tops heart-shaped of wood horn or bone we whipped them with a long thong of buckskin the handle was a stick about a foot long and sometimes we whittled the stick to make it spoon-shaped at one end we played games with these tops two to fifty boys at one time each whips his top until it hums then one takes the lead and the rest follow in a sort of obstacle race the top must spin all the way through there were bars of snow over which we must pilot our top in the spoon end of our whip then again we would toss it in the air on to another open spot of ice or smooth snow crust from twenty to fifty paces away the top that holds out the longest is the winner we loved to play in the water when we had no ponies we often had swimming matches of our own and sometimes made rafts with which we crossed lakes and rivers it was a common thing to duck a young or timid boy or to carry him into deep water to struggle as best he might i remember a perilous ride with a companion on an unmanageable log when we were both less than seven years old the older boys had put us on this uncertain bark and pushed us out into the swift current of the river i cannot speak for my comrade in distress but i can say now that i would rather ride on a swift bronco any day than try to stay on and steady a short log in a river i never knew how we managed to prevent a shipwreck on that voyage and to reach the shore we had many curious wild pets 
there were young foxes bears wolves raccoons fawns buffalo calves and birds of all kinds tamed by various boys my pets were different at different times but i particularly remember one i once had a grizzly bear for a pet and so far as he and i were concerned our relations were charming and very close but i hardly know whether he made more enemies for me or i for him it was his habit to treat every boy unmercifully who injured me end of games and sports recording by lucretia b chapter five of indian child life this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Indian Child Life by Charles Eastman. Chapter 5 An Indian Boy's Training. Very early, the Indian boy assumed the task of preserving and transmitting the legends of his ancestors. And his race almost every evening a myth or a true story of some deed done in the past was narrated by one of the parents or grandparents while the boy listened with parted lips and glistening eyes on the following evening it was usually required to repeat it if he was not an apt scholar he struggled long with his task but as a rule the indian boy is a good listener and has a good memory so that the stories were tolerably well mastered the household became his audience by which he was alternately criticized and applauded this sort of teaching at once enlightens the boy's mind and stimulates his ambition his conception of his own future career becomes a vivid and irresistible force whatever there is for him to learn must be learned whatever qualifications are necessary to a truly great man he must seek at any expense of danger and hardship such was the feeling of the imaginative and brave young indian it became apparent to him in early life that he must accustom himself to rove alone and not to fear or dislike the impression of solitude it seems to be a popular idea that all the characteristic skill of the Indian is instinctive and hereditary. This is a mistake. All the stoicism and patience of the Indian are acquired traits, and continual practice alone makes him master of the art of woodcraft. Physical training and dieting were not neglected. I remember that I was not allowed to have beef soup or any warm drink. The soup was for the old men general rules for the young were never to take their food very hot nor to drink much water my uncle who educated me up to the age of fifteen years was a strict disciplinarian and a good teacher when i left the teepee in the morning he would say hakada look closely to everything you see and at evening on my return he often used to catechize me for an hour or so on which side of the trees is the lighter colored bark on which side do they have the most regular branches it was his custom to let me name all the new birds that i had seen during the day i would name them according to the color or the shape of the bill or their song or the appearance and locality of the nest in fact anything about the bird that impressed me as characteristic i made many ridiculous errors i must admit he then usually informed me of the correct name occasionally i made a hit and this he would warmly commend he went much deeper into this science when i was a little older that is about the age of eight or nine years he would say for instance how do you know that there are fish in yonder lake because they jump out of the water for flies at midday he would smile at my prompt but superficial reply what do you think of the little pebbles grouped together under the shallow water and what made the pretty curved marks in the sandy bottom and the little sandbanks where do you find the fish eating birds have the inlet and the outlet of a lake anything to do with the question he did not expect a correct reply at once 
to all the questions that he put to me on these occasions, but he meant to make me observant and a good student of nature. Hakada, he would say to me, you ought to follow the example of the Shantokicha, the wolf. Even when he is surprised and runs for his life, he will pause to take one more look at you before he enters his final retreat. So you must take a second look at everything you see. It is better to view animals unobserved. I have been a witness to their courtships and their quarrels, and have learned many of their secrets in this way. I was once the unseen spectator of a thrilling battle between a pair of grizzly bears and three buffaloes. A rash act for the bears, for it was in the moon of strawberries, when the buffaloes sharpen and polish their horns for bloody contests among themselves. I advise you, my boy, never to approach a grizzly's den from the front, but to steal up behind and throw your blanket or a stone in front of the hole. He does not usually rush for it, but first puts his head out and listens, and then comes out very indifferently and sits on his haunches on the mound in front of the hole before he makes any attack. While he is exposing himself in this fashion, aim at his heart. Always be as cool as the animal himself. And thus he armed me against the cunning of savage beasts by teaching me how to outwit them. In hunting, he would resume, you will be guided by the habits of the animal you seek. Remember that a moose stays in swampy or low land, or between high mountains near a spring or lake, for thirty to sixty days at a time. Most large game moves about continually, except the doe in the spring. It is then a very easy matter to find her with a fawn. Conceal yourself in a convenient place as soon as you observe any signs of the presence of either, and then call with your birchen doe caller. Whichever one hears you first will soon appear in your neighborhood, but you must be very watchful, or you may be made a fawn of by a large wildcat. They understand the characteristic call of the doe perfectly well. When you have any difficulty with a bear or a wildcat, that is, if the creature shows any signs of attacking you, you must make him fully understand that you have seen him and are aware of his intentions. If you're not well equipped for a pitched battle, the only way to make him retreat is to take a long, sharp-pointed pole for a spear and rush toward him. No wild beast will face this unless he is cornered and already wounded. These fierce beasts are generally afraid of the common weapon of the larger animals, the horns, and if these are very long and sharp, they dare not risk an open fight. There is one exception to this rule. The gray wolf will attack fiercely when very hungry, but their courage depends upon their numbers. In this they are like white men. One wolf or two will never attack a man. They will stampede a herd of buffaloes in order to get at the calves. They will rush upon a herd of antelopes, for these are helpless. But they are always careful about attacking man. Of this nature were the instructions of my uncle, who was widely known at that time as among the greatest hunters of his tribe. All boys were expected to endure hardship without complaint. In savage warfare, a young man must, of course, be an athlete, and used to undergoing all sorts of privations. He must be able to go without food and water for two and three days without displaying any weakness, or to run for a day and a night without any rest. He must be able to traverse a pathless and wild country without losing his way either in the day or night time. He cannot refuse to do any of these things if he aspires to be a warrior. Sometimes my uncle would waken me very early in the morning and challenge me to fast with him all day. I had to accept the challenge. We blackened our faces with charcoal so that every boy in the village would know that I was fasting for the day. Then the little tempters would make my life a misery until the merciful sun hid behind the western hills. I can scarcely recall the time when my stern teacher began to give sudden war whoops over my head in the morning while I was sound asleep. He expected me to leap up with perfect presence of mind, always ready to grasp a weapon of some sort, and to give a shrill whoop in reply. If I was sleepy, 
or startled and hardly knew what I was about he would ridicule me and say that I need never expect to sell my scalp dear Often he would vary these tactics by shooting off his gun just outside of the lodge while I was yet asleep at the same time giving blood-curdling yells after a time I became used to this when Indians went upon the warpath it was their custom to try the new warriors thoroughly before coming to an engagement for instance when they were near a hostile camp they would select the novices to go after the water and make them do all sorts of things to prove their courage in accordance with this idea my uncle used to send me off after water when we camped after dark in a strange place perhaps the country was full of wild beasts and for aught I knew there might be scouts from hostile bands of Indians lurking in that very neighborhood Yet I never objected for that would show cowardice I picked my way through the woods dipped my pail in the water and hurried back Always careful to make as little noise as a cat being only a boy my heart would leap at every crackling of a dry twig or distant hooting of an owl until at last I reached our teepee then my uncle would perhaps say ah Hakada you are a thorough warrior empty out the precious contents of the pail and order me to go a second time Imagine how I felt But I wish to be a brave man as much as a white boy desires to be a great lawyer or even president of the United States Silently I would take the pail and endeavor to retrace my footsteps in the dark with all this our manners and morals were not neglected I was made to respect the adults and especially the aged I was not allowed to join in their discussions nor even to speak in their presence unless requested to do so Indian etiquette was very strict and among the requirements was that of avoiding the direct address a term of relationship or some title of courtesy was commonly used instead of the personal name by those who wished to show respect we were taught generosity to the poor and reverence for the great mystery religion was the basis of all indian training end of chapter 5、6 of indian child life this is a librivox recording All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Indian Child Life by Charles Eastman. The Boy Hunter. There was almost as much difference between the Indian boys who were brought up on the open prairies and those of the woods. As between city and country boys the hunting of the prairie boys was limited and their knowledge of natural history imperfect they were as a rule good riders but in all around physical development much inferior to the red men of the forest our hunting varied with the season of the year and the nature of the country which was for the time our home our chief weapon was the bow and arrows and perhaps if we were lucky a knife was possessed by someone in the crowd in the olden times knives and hatchets were made from bone and sharp stones for fire we used a flint with a spongy piece of dry wood and a stone to strike with another way of starting fire was for several of the boys to sit down in a circle and rub two pieces of dry spongy wood together one after another until the wood took fire we hunted in company a great deal though it was a common thing for a boy to set out for the woods quite alone and he usually enjoyed himself fully as much our game consisted mainly of small birds rabbits squirrels and grouse fishing too occupied much of our time we hardly ever passed a creek or a pond without searching for some signs of fish when fish were present we always managed to get some fish lines were made of wild hemp sinew or horsehair we either caught fish with lines snared or speared them or shot them with bow and arrows in the fall we charmed them up to the surface 
by gently tickling them with a stick and quickly threw them out we have sometimes dammed the brooks and driven the larger fish into a willow basket made for that purpose it was part of our hunting to find new and strange things in the woods we examined the slightest sign of life and if a bird had scratched the leaves off the ground or a bear dragged up a root for his morning meal we stopped to speculate on the time it was done if we saw a large old tree with some scratches on its bark we concluded that a bear or some raccoons must be living there in that case we didn't go any nearer than was necessary but later reported the incident at home an old deer track would at once bring on a warm discussion as to whether it was the track of a buck or a doe generally at noon we met and compared our game noting at the same time the peculiar characteristics of everything we had killed it was not merely a hunt for we combined with it the study of animal life we also kept a strict account of our game and thus learned who were the best shots among the boys i'm sorry to say that we were merciless towards the birds we often took their eggs and their young ones my brother chatana and i once had a disagreeable adventure while bird hunting we were accustomed to catch in our hands young ducks and geese during the summer and while doing this we happened to find a crane's nest of course we were delighted with our good luck but as it was already midsummer the young cranes two in number were rather large and they were a little ways from the nest we also observed that the two old cranes were in a swampy place nearby but as it was molting time we didn't suppose that they would venture on dry land so we proceeded to chase the young birds but they were fleet runners and it took us some time to come up with them meanwhile the parent birds had heard the cries of their little ones and come to their rescue they were chasing us while we followed the birds it was really a perilous encounter our strong bows finally gained the victory in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with the angry cranes but after that we hardly ever hunted a crane's nest almost all birds make some resistance when their eggs or young are taken but they will seldom attack a man fearlessly we used to climb large trees for birds of all kinds but we never undertook to get young owls unless they were on the ground the hooting owl especially is a dangerous bird to attack under these circumstances I was once trying to catch a yellow winged woodpecker in its nest when my arm became twisted and lodged in a deep hole so that I couldn't get it out without the aid of a knife but we were a long way from home and my only companion was a deaf mute cousin of mine I was about 50 feet up in the tree in a very uncomfortable position but I had to wait there for more than an hour before he brought me the knife with which I finally released myself Our devices for trapping small animals were rude, but they were often successful for instance We used to gather up a peck or so of large sharp pointed burrs and scatter them in the rabbit's furrow like path in the morning we would find the little fellow sitting quietly in his tracks unable to move for the burrs stuck to his feet another way of snaring rabbits and grouse was the following we made nooses of twisted horsehair which we tied very firmly to the top of a limber young tree then bent the latter down to the track and fastened the hole with a slip knot after adjusting the noose when the rabbit runs his head through the noose he pulls the slip knot and is quickly carried up by the spring of the young tree this is a good plan for the rabbit is out of harm's way as he swings high in the air perhaps the most enjoyable of all was the chipmunk hunt we killed these animals at any time of the year but the special time to hunt them was in march after the first thaw the chipmunks burrow a hole through the snow crust and make their first appearance for the season sometimes as many as fifty will come together and hold a special reunion these gatherings occur early in the morning from daybreak to about nine o'clock 
We boys learned this, among other secrets of nature, and got our blunt-headed arrows together in good season for the chipmunk expedition. We generally went in groups of six to a dozen or fifteen, to see which would get the most. On the evening before, we selected several boys who could imitate the chipmunk's call with wild oat straws, and each of these provided himself with a supply of straws. The crust will hold the boys nicely at this time of the year. Bright and early, they all come together at the appointed place, from which each group starts out in a different direction, agreeing to meet somewhere at a given position of the sun. My first experience of this kind is still well remembered. It was a fine, crisp March morning, and the sun had not yet shown itself among the distant treetops as we hurried along through the ghostly wood. Presently, we arrived at a place where there were many signs of the animals. Then each of us selected a tree, and took up his position behind it. The chipmunk caller sat upon a log as motionless as he could, and began to call. Soon we heard the patter of little feet on the hard snow. Then we saw the chipmunks approaching from all directions. Some stopped and ran experimentally up a tree or a log as if uncertain of the exact direction of the call others chased one another about in a few minutes the chipmunk caller was besieged with them some ran all over his person others under him and still others ran up the tree against which he was sitting each boy remained immovable until their leader gave the signal then a great shout arose, and the chipmunks in their flight all ran up the different trees. Now the shooting match began. The little creatures seemed to realize their hopeless position. They would try again and again to come down the trees and flee away from the deadly aim of the youthful hunters. But they were shot down very fast, and whenever several of them rushed toward the ground, the little redskin hugged the tree and yelled frantically to scare them up again. Each boy shoots always against the trunk of the tree, so that the arrow may bound back to him every time. Otherwise, when he had shot away all of them, he would be helpless, and another, who had cleared his own tree, would come and take away his game. So there was warm competition. Sometimes a desperate chipmunk would jump from the top of the tree in order to escape, which was considered a joke on the boy who lost it, and a triumph for the brave little animal. At last all were killed or gone, and then we went on to another place, keeping up the sport until the sun came out and the chipmunks refused to answer the call. End of The Boy Hunter Seven of Indian Child Life this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Indian Child Life by Charles Eastman. Chapter 7 Evening in the Lodge. I had been skating on that part of the lake where there was an overflow, and came home somewhat cold. I cannot say just how cold it was, but it must have been intensely so, for the trees were cracking all about me like pistol shots. I did not mind, because I was wrapped up in my buffalo robe with the hair inside, and a wide leather belt held it about my loins. My skates were nothing more than strips of basswood bark bound upon my feet. I had taken off my frozen moccasins and put on dry ones in their places. Where have you been, and what have you been doing? Unchida asked as she placed before me some roast venison in a wooden bowl. Did you see any tracks of moose or bear? No, grandmother. I have only been playing at the lower end of the lake. I have something to ask you, I said, eating my dinner and supper together with all the relish of a hungry boy who had been skating in the cold for half a day. I found this feather, grandmother, and I could not make out what tribe wear feathers in that shape. Uh, I am not a man. You had better ask your uncle. Besides, you should know it yourself by this time. You are now old enough to think about eagle feathers. 
I felt mortified by this reminder of my ignorance. It seemed a reflection on me that I was not ambitious enough to have found all such matters out before. Uncle, you will tell me, won't you? I said, in an appealing tone. I am surprised, my boy, that you should fail to recognize this feather. It is a Cree medicine feather and not a warrior's. Then, I said with much embarrassment, you had better tell me again, Uncle, the language of the feathers. I have really forgotten it all. The day was now gone. The moon had risen, but the cold had not lessened, for the trunks of the trees were still snapping all about our teepee, which was lighted and warmed by the immense logs which Unchida's industry had provided. My uncle, White Footprint, now undertook to explain to me the significance of the eagle's feather. The eagle is the most warlike bird, he began, and the most kingly of all birds. Besides, his feathers are unlike any others, and these are the reasons why they are used by our people to signify deeds of bravery. It is not true that when a man wears a feather bonnet, each one of the feathers represents the killing of a foe or even a coup. When a man wears an eagle feather upright upon his head, he is supposed to have counted one of four coups upon his enemy. Well, then, a coup does not mean the killing of an enemy? No, it is the after-stroke, or touching of the body, after he falls. It is so ordered, because oftentimes the touching of an enemy is much more difficult to accomplish than the shooting of one from a distance. It requires a strong heart to face the whole body of the enemy in order to count the coup on the fallen one who lies under cover of his kinsman's fire. Many a brave man has been lost in the attempt. When a warrior approaches his foe, dead or alive, he calls upon the other warriors to witness by saying, I, fearless bear, your brave, again perform the brave deed of counting the first, or second, or third, or fourth coup upon the body of the bravest of your enemies. Naturally, those who are present will see the act and be able to testify to it. When they return, the heralds, as you know, announce publicly all such deeds of valor, which then become a part of the man's war record. Any brave who would wear the eagle's feather must give proof of his right to do so. When a brave is wounded in the same battle where he counted his coup, he wears the feather hanging downward. When he is wounded but makes no count, he trims his feather and in that case it need not be an eagle feather. All other feathers are merely ornaments. When a warrior wears a feather with a round mark, it means that he slew his enemy. When the mark is cut into the feather and painted red, it means that he took the scalp. A brave who has been successful in ten battles is entitled to a war bonnet, and if he is a recognized leader, he is permitted to wear one with long trailing plumes. Also those who have counted many coups may tip the ends of the feathers with bits of white or colored down. Sometimes the eagle feather is tipped with a strip of weasel skin. That means the wearer had the honor of killing, scalping, and counting the first coup upon the enemy all at the same time. This feather you found was worn by a Cree. It is indiscriminately painted. All of the feathers worn by the common Indians mean nothing, he added. Tell me, uncle, whether it would be proper for me to wear any feathers at all if I have never gone upon the warpath? You could wear any other kind of feathers, but not an eagle's, replied my uncle, although sometimes one is worn on great occasions by the child of a noted man to indicate the father's dignity and position. The fire had gone down somewhat, so I pushed the embers together and wrapped my robe more closely about me. Now and then the ice on the lake would burst with a loud report like thunder. Unchida was busy restringing one of Uncle's old snowshoes. There were two different kinds that he wore. One had a straight toe and long, the other shorter and with an upturned toe. She had one of the shoes fastened toe down between sticks driven into the ground while she put in some new strings and tightened the others. Aunt Four Stars was beading a new pair of moccasins. Wabida, 
the dog the companion of my boyhood days was in trouble because he insisted upon bringing his extra bone into the teepee while uncheedah was determined that he should not i sympathized with him because i saw the matter as he did if he should bury it in the snow outside i knew shunktokicha the coyote would surely steal it i knew just how anxious wabeda was about his bone it was a fat bone i mean a bone of a fat deer and all indians know how much better they are than the other kind wabeda always hated to see a good thing go to waste his eyes spoke words to me for he and i had been friends for a long time when i was afraid of anything in the woods he would get in front of me at once and gently wag his tail he always made it a point to look directly in my face his kind large eyes gave me a thousand assurances when i was perplexed he would hang about me until he understood the situation many times i believed he saved my life by uttering the dog word in time most animals even the dangerous grizzly do not care to be seen when the two-legged kind and his dog are about when i feared a surprise by a bear or a gray wolf i would say to wabeda now my dog give your war whoop and immediately he would sit up on his haunches and bark to beat the band as you white boys say when a bear or wolf heard the noise he would be apt to retreat sometimes i helped wabeda and gave a war whoop of my own this drove the deer away as well but it relieved my mind when he appealed to me on this occasion therefore i said come my dog let us bury your bone so that no shunktokicha will take it he appeared satisfied with my suggestion so we went out together we dug in the snow and buried our bone wrapped up in a piece of old blanket partly burned and then we covered it up again with snow we knew that the coyote would not touch anything burnt i did not put it up a tree because wabeda always objected to that and i made it a point to consult his wishes whenever i could i came in and wabeda followed me with two short rib bones in his mouth apparently he did not care to risk those delicacies there exclaimed uncheedah you still insist upon bringing in some sort of bone but i begged her to let him gnaw them inside because it was so cold having been granted this privilege he settled himself at my back and i became absorbed in some specially nice arrows that uncle was making oh uncle you must put on three feathers to all of them so that they can fly straight i suggested yes but if there are only two feathers they will fly faster he answered wow wabeda uttered his suspicions wow he said again and rushed for the entrance of the teepee he kicked me over as he went and scattered the burning embers ina ina uncheedah exclaimed but he was already outside wow 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 a deep guttural voice answered him out i rushed with my bow and arrows in my hand come uncle come a big cinnamon bear i shouted as i emerged from the teepee uncle sprang out and in a moment he had sent a swift arrow through the bear's heart the animal fell dead he had just begun to dig up wabeda's bone when the dog's quick ear had heard the sound ah uncle wabeda and i ought to have at least a little eaglet's feather for this i too sent my small arrow into the bear before he fell i exclaimed but i thought all bears ought to be in their lodges in the winter time what was this one doing at this time of the year and night well said my uncle i will tell you among the tribes some are naturally lazy the cinnamon bear is the lazy one of his tribe he alone sleeps out of doors in the winter and because he is not a warm bed he is soon hungry sometimes he lives in the hollow trunk of a tree where he had made a bed of dry grass but when the night is very cold like tonight he has to move about to keep himself from freezing and as he prowls around he gets hungry we dragged the huge carcass within our lodge oh what nice claws he has uncle i exclaimed eagerly can i have them for my necklace it is only the old medicine men who wear them regularly the son of a great warrior who has killed a grizzly may wear them upon a public occasion he explained and you are just like my father 
and are considered the best hunter among the Santees and Sissitons. You have killed many grizzlies, so that no one can object to my bear's claw necklace, I said appealingly. White Footprint smiled. My boy, you shall have them, he said, but it is always better to earn them yourself. He cut the claws off carefully for my use. Tell me, uncle, whether you could wear these claws all the time, I asked. Yes, I am entitled to wear them, but they are so heavy and uncomfortable, he replied with a superior air. At last the bear had been skinned and dressed, and we all resumed our usual places. Uncheedah was particularly pleased to have some more fat for her cooking. Now, grandmother, tell me the story of the bear's fat. I shall be so happy if you will, I begged. It is a good story, and it is true. You should know it by heart and gain a lesson from it, she replied. It was in the forests of Minnesota, in the country that now belongs to the Ojibways. From the Bedawakanton Sioux village, a young married couple went into the woods to get fresh venison. The snow was deep. The ice was thick. Far away in the woods they pitched their lonely teepee. The young man was a well-known hunter, and his wife a good maiden of the village. He hunted entirely on snowshoes, because the snow was very deep. His wife had to wear snowshoes, too, to get to the spot where they pitched their tent. It was thawing the day they went out, so their path was distinct after the freeze came again. The young man killed many deer and bears. His wife was very busy curing the meat and trying out the fat while he was away hunting each day. In the evenings she kept on trying the fat. He sat on one side of the teepee, and she on the other. One evening she had just lowered a kettle of fat to cool, and as she looked into the hot fat, she saw the face of an Ojibwe scout looking down at them through the smoke hole. She said nothing, nor did she betray herself in any way. After a little she said to her husband in a natural voice, Marpitopa, someone is looking at us through the smoke hole, and I think it is an enemy scout. Then Marpitopa, four skies, took up his bow and arrows, and began to straighten and dry them for the next day's hunt, talking and laughing meanwhile. Suddenly he turned and sent an arrow upward, killing the Ojibwe, who fell dead at their door. Quick, Oduta, he exclaimed, you must hurry home upon our trail. I will stay here. When the scout does not return, the war party may come in a body or send another scout. If only one comes, I can soon dispatch him, and then I will follow you. If I do not do that, they will overtake us in our flight. Oduta, Scarlet, protested and begged to be allowed to stay with her husband, but at last she came away to get reinforcements. Then Marpitopa, Four Skies, put more sticks on the fire so that the teepee might be brightly lit and show him the way. He then took the scalp of the enemy and proceeded on his track until he came to the upturned root of a great tree. There he spread out his arrows and laid out his tomahawk. Soon two more scouts were sent by the Ojibwe war party to see what was the trouble and why the first one failed to come back. He heard them as they approached. They were on snowshoes. When they came close to him, he shot an arrow into the foremost. As for the other, in his effort to turn quickly, his snowshoes stuck in the deep snow and detained him, so Marpi Topa killed them both. Quickly he took the scalps and followed Waduta. He ran hard, but the Ojibways suspected something wrong and came to the lonely teepee to find all their scouts had been killed. They followed the path of Marpi Topa and Waduta to the main village, and there a great battle was fought on the ice. Many were killed on both sides. It was after this that the Sioux moved to the Mississippi River. I was sleepy by this time, and I rolled myself up in my buffalo robe and fell asleep. End of chapter 7 Evening in the Lodge Indian Child Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Indian Child Life by Charles Eastman. 
A Letter to the Children Dear children, you will like to know that the man who wrote these true stories is himself one of the people he describes so pleasantly and so lovingly for you. He hopes that when you have finished this book the Indians will seem to you very real and very friendly. He is not willing that all your knowledge of the race that formerly possessed this continent should come from the lips of strangers and enemies, or that you should think of them as bloodthirsty and treacherous, as savage and unclean. War, you know, is always cruel, and it is true that there were stern fighting men among the Indians, as well as among your own forefathers. But there were also men of peace, men generous and kindly and religious. There were tender mothers and happy little ones, and a home life that was pure and true. There were high ideals of loyalty and honor. It will do you good and make you happier to read of these things. Perhaps you wonder how a real live Indian could write a book. I will tell you how. The story of this man's life is itself as wonderful as a fairy tale. Born in a wigwam, as he has told you, and early left motherless, he was brought up like the little Hiawatha by a good grandmother. When he was four years old, war broke out between his people and the United States government. The Indians were defeated, and many of them were killed. Some fled northward into Canada and took refuge under the British flag, among them the writer of this book, with his grandmother and an uncle. His father was captured by the whites. After ten years of that wild life, now everywhere at an end, of which he has given you a true picture in his books, his father, whom the good President Lincoln had pardoned and released from the military prison, made the long and dangerous journey to Canada to find and bring back his youngest son. The Sioux were beginning to learn that the old life must go, and that if they were to survive at all they must follow the white man's road, long and hard as it looked to a free people. They were beginning to plow and sow and send their children to school. Ohiesa, the winner, as the boy was called, came home with his father to what was then Dakota Territory, to a little settlement of Sioux homesteaders. Everything about the new life was strange to him, and at first he did not like it at all. He had thoughts of running away and making his way back to Canada, but his father, many lightnings, who had been baptized a Christian under the name of Jacob Eastman, told him that he too must take a new name, and he chose that of Charles Alexander Eastman. He was told to cut off his long hair and put on citizen's clothing. Then his father made him choose between going to school and working at the plow. Ohiesa tried plowing for half a day. It was hard work to break the tough prairie sod with his father's oxen and the strange implement they gave him. He decided to try school. Rather to his surprise, he liked it, and he kept on. His teachers were pleased with his progress, and soon better opportunities opened to him. He was sent farther east to a better school, where he continued to do well, and soon went higher. In the long summer vacations he worked on farms and shops and offices, and in winter he studied and played football and all the other games you play, until after about fifteen or sixteen years he found himself with the diplomas of a famous college and a great university a bachelor of science, a doctor of medicine, and a doubly educated man, educated in the lore of the wilderness as well as in some of the deeper secrets of civilization. Since that day a good many more years have passed. Ohiesa, known as Dr. Charles A. Eastman, has now a home and six children of his own among the New England hills. He has hundreds of devoted friends of both races. He is the author of five books which have been widely read, some of them in England, France, and Germany, as well as in America, and he speaks face to face to thousands of people every year. Perhaps some of you may have heard from his own lips his recollections of wild life. You may find all the stories in this book, and many more of the same sort, in the books called Indian Boyhood and Old Indian Days, published by Doubleday, Page, and Company of Garden City, Long Island, who have kindly consented to the publication of this little volume in order that the children in our schools might read stories of real Indians by a real Indian.
End of A Letter to the Children